Well, I, I first want to start by thanking Mayor Heapja. Uh, the mayor has been a steadfast advocate for uh, energy and climate issues in the face of uh, economic and, frankly, some political headwinds on this. And he has uh, stayed true to that. And he's made a personal commitment to this, too. I mean, on the Energy Commission, he serves himself and has advanced some of the, uh, some of the great things that we do there. So I want to start by thanking the mayor. Um, mayor, mayor, uh, mayor Heefcha said, you know, the action's at the local level. I'll, I'll say I work at University of Michigan. I teach energy policy. Uh, I work at our um, sustainability institute as the education director, and I've spent time professionally uh, in the nonprofit sector working at the Ecology Center and at uh, Environment Michigan working on energy and climate policy, but I'm spending my time now at the local level, and that's because that's where I think we're going to make the most progress. I'm on the Energy Commission here. I was on the Climate Action uh, Planning Task Force, and I'm going to explain a little bit more what that is. And I've recently uh, agreed to be a co-chair of the C Community Climate Partnership. And that's really what we're, what we're launching today. We're, all of our speakers here today are part of this Community Climate Partnership, and it's going to be our chance as a community to really engage and make the climate plans go. Now, to start this off, I want to provide just a little bit of context. Uh, with a video here that comes from the Post Carbon Institute. Now, this is a place that's done some great work on m making the transition to fossil fuels uh, smooth. It all started with a big bang. Wait, we don't have to go back that far. The Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago. Uh, no, still too far. Try this. It's the Middle Ages. People in Britain run out of firewood, start burning coal. But they use up the coal on the ground. Miners dig deep. Coal mines fill with water. Samuel Newcomen invents a coal-burning steam engine to pump out water so miners can keep digging. James Watt makes it practical for other uses. Now we have ingredients for the Industrial Revolution, fossil fuels, and a way to put them to work. All hell breaks loose. Coal miners bog down lugging coal. Rails make it easier. Rails and steam engine combined make a railroad. Michael Faraday makes the first electric motor. Nikola Tesla invents alternating current. Soon utility companies start burning coal to generate electricity. Meanwhile, Edwin Drake drills the first rock oil well in Pennsylvania, and Carl Daimler builds an automobile running on petroleum. Coal tar and oil are turned into industrial chemicals and pharmaceuticals that prolong life, more population growth. The Wright brothers start oil-fueled aviation. Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch make fertilizer from fossil fuels. Fertilizer and oil-powered tractors expand food production, feeding more people. World War I is the first fossil-fueled conflict. Then comes World War II, giving us guided missiles and atom bombs. In between is a Great Depression, partly caused by overproduction. Powered assembly lines make products faster than people need them. Advertising executives invent consumerism to soak up overproduction. It's the 1950s. Advertisers use television to hook new generations of consumers. In the 70s, there's an oil shock. Everyone's shocked to realize how dependent they are on oil. With the energy crisis, the environmental movement is born. But oil prices fall and everyone forgets energy shortages. There's a showdown between market and planned economies. Market wins. Goodbye, evil Soviet empire. Politicians decide the market will solve everything. Personal computers arrive. Globalization takes over when the market notices labor is cheaper in China. Suddenly everyone has a cell phone, but world oil production stalls out. China is now burning half the world's coal to make export products. But where will China get more coal and oil to fuel more growth? Environmental problems everywhere. Rising CO2 levels lead to record heat waves, floods, droughts. Oceans acidify. Topsoil erodes by 25 billion tons a year from industrial agriculture. Ancient forests disappear. Species go extinct at a thousand times normal rates. Fresh water is scarce or polluted. Oil companies drill in miles of seawater because the easy oil is gone. But a deep water oil platform explodes and fouls the Gulf of Mexico. Manufacturing moves to polluting countries where labor is cheap, while the U.S. becomes a casino. The financial sector is 40% of the economy. But Wall Street is overleveraged. Banks fail. Unemployment soars. Credit evaporates. The economy is on the verge of collapse. Okay, present time. It's amazing how far we've come in 200 years, just three human lifetimes, from the beginning of industrialism till now. But where are we headed? 
We can't keep doubling human population. We can't keep dumping carbon in the atmosphere. We can't keep ruining topsoil. We can't keep growing population and consumption or basing our economy on depleting fossil fuels. We can't just print more money to solve the debt crisis. It's been an exhilarating ride, but there are limits. Now, it's not the end of the world, but we have to do four things fast. Learn to live without fossil fuels, adapt to the end of economic growth as we've known it, support 7 billion humans and stabilize population at a sustainable level, and deal with our legacy of environmental destruction. In short, we have to live within nature's budget of renewable resources at rates of natural replenishment. Can we do it? We have no choice. Alternative energy sources are important, but none can fully replace fossil fuels in the time we have. Also, we've designed and built our infrastructure for transport, electricity, and farming to suit oil, coal, and gas. Changing to different energy sources will require us to redesign cities, manufacturing processes, health care, and more. We'll also have to rethink some of our cultural values. None of our global problems can be tackled in isolation, and many cannot be fully solved. We have to prepare for business as unusual. Our best goal is resilience, the ability to absorb shocks and keep going. If we do nothing, we still get to a post-carbon future, but it will be bleak. However, if we plan the transition, we can have a world that supports robust communities of healthy, creative people and ecosystems with millions of other species. One way or the other, we're in for the ride of a lifetime. Understand the issues and pitch in. It's all hands on deck. Now, Mayor Heefsha talked about some of the bad news here. And I, I would say the bad news is coming from our political leadership in Washington, right? Uh, that's not where this problem is going to get solved. That is clear. I actually think we, there was a big opportunity blown in uh, Obama's first term. Uh, lots of blame to go around. Obama himself deserves some of it, right? Um, but there's no question that federal, the, at the federal level, there's little to nothing that's going to happen in the short term, right? State level, unfortunately, is very similar right now. Uh, the, you know, our state leadership, if anything, we've, has been moving the opposite way on these issues. Uh, the special interests, the utilities, and others really have a very tight grip on our state political infrastructure, right? So we can't be looking towards the state, but the local level is where it could happen, and there are amazing things happening. And one, just one example of this is uh, what's been happening with solar. And we have a huge boom in solar. And actually, I don't have the year 2013 on here, but I just heard that it was the biggest year ever for solar right, in, in the U.S. Uh, and actually in China, uh, Wayne, Wayne Appleyard, our Energy Commission chair, just share, shared this uh, with me. Uh, China alone actually produced more solar capacity than the rest of the world last year. And so the boom is happening, happening globally on this. Um, the, the state that we're at, and we're kind of going from the big picture, and we're going to narrow in a bit to the communities in j just a moment here, is... We're beyond the scientific and technical challenges here. I think those have been solved or solvable right now when we talk about climate change. Um, but as my colleague uh, Andy Hoffman at the Urban Institute says, it's about building a social consensus to act right now. Um, and the social consensus begins and maybe ends in our own communities. And that, that's really what we're talking about here. And it's where the action is and should be. Now in Ann Arbor, we have an amazing base for this. Okay, so first, the city, and, and great kudos to our, to our city's energy staff, to Mayor Heefja and the rest, because Ann Arbor is ahead on this. Ann Arbor has been working really hard on this. And the first thing, of course, is to see where actually our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from. And what's interesting here, one, of course, we have a big driver at the, of the university. That's about a third of our emissions, and that's just the direct emissions from, from the university. I mean, you have to, of course, know that's you know, a campus of 80,000 people. Uh, that's part of it, and that doesn't include transportation to and from. That's the direct emissions from the university. But when we look at what's driving it here, it's about, about a quarter of everything else is from transportation, from our homes, and from our businesses, right? Um, if we look at the city itself, all right, so what the city directly controls, municipal emissions, it is uh, less than 2% of the overall emissions, wastewater treatment plant, things, things like that drive that. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the efforts 
that have to happen have to come from us in our homes, you know, in our vehicles, how we, trans how we get places and, and from our businesses, right? There's no sort of substitute uh, for, for looking at it in that, in that way. Now, the city has, has uh, commissioned a clim climate action plan, okay? And this, this plan uh, was fantastic, had lots of community support. Many people in this room actually were involved in drafting this up and came up with really strong targets. And the emissions targets are 8% reductions by 2015, 25% by 2025, and 90% by 2050. And I'll say, you know, we took a strong position it, when we were drafting the climate action uh, plan that we need to base this on the physics, the laws of thermodynamics, and what the best scientists are saying, not on the politics and the economics, because we think that can, that can follow. Now, I'm not saying we drafted an unrealistic plan, but what we did do, and what you see here is that black line is business as, use, as usual. All right, if we do nothing, based on the 0.7% uh, emissions growth, sorry, it's a little bit smudged, but you can get the general idea, we have to get to that, that line below, that green line below. And that means there's a lot, there's a lot of work um, to do to get there, and it's completely reliant on citizen participation. Um, and in some ways, I believe that that starts tonight. Now, there are amazing things that have already been happening in this, in this community. Um, and what we're asking people to do at, at this set forum tonight is to sm start submitting ideas, stories of what you are doing, what you would like to be doing, what you've been inspired by. And we have a board up there, uh, the board, I can't see it. Oh, it's in the back there, um, that has that. And Nate and Monica, two of the folks who've been involved in this, are going to circulate cards where you can write this down. You may already, may already have these. But we want to start gathering these community stories because it's really important to us. Um, and I also want to say we're going we're gonna to start this conversation here. We're going to continue the conversation. Hopefully folks can join us. Um, we're going to Arbor Brewing Company, um, to the tap, tap room at 8.30. These are hard conversations. A little lubrication never, never hurts for them, right? <laughs> so we invite everybody to join us um, after, afterward to do, do that. So I want to close what, what I have to say and introduce the rest of the speakers with a quote from one of my favorite, favorite speakers thinkers on this, and this is Paul Hawken. Paul Hawken wrote The Ecology of Commerce, and he recently gave this address uh, at a graduation ceremony. It's called, it's, the speech is called, You Are Brilliant and the Earth is Hiring. He says, basically, civilization needs a new operating system. You are the programmers, and we need it within a few decades. The planet came with a set of instructions, but we seem to have misplaced them. If you look at the science about what is happening on Earth and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand that data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore this Earth, and the lives of the poor, and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. Do what needs to be done and check to see if it was impossible only after you were done. And I think that should be what, how we view, how we move forward as a community. So to start us on the path, tonight we have a lineup of folks from the Community Climate Partnership, all involved in, in diff different ways. Um, and we're going to start by looking at what some other communities are doing, not only on mitigation, so stopping climate change, but on adaptation, because we know impacts are happening right now and how our community is going to re respond to that. Um, and then we're going to sort of talk about what's happening within our own community here. And then we're going to end directly with ways to, to get involved and then open it up for, for Q&A. That, that's our format for the evening.